Greeting and welcome. My name is Miro Sake, Chair and Associate Professor of the Department of Religious Study. Today, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Anne Saftel. She has continuously worked to conserve Buddhist art within monasteries, dharma centers, museums, universities, and communities since 1970. The topic of today's lecture is High Altitude Preservation Projects in Remote Nepali Borderlands of Tsum. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Anne Saftel. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Maroj, who I've met in person in Nepal. And we have other things planned in the future to go places in Nepal. It's always an honor to share our ongoing conservation work taking place, especially in remote communities, in the high altitude, the rugged and mountainous part of Nepal that is bordering on the Tibetan region. Working with the nonprofit Treasure Caretaker Training, our conservators travel to this extraordinary region for hands-on projects at the invitation of the communities. Today, after introductions, you can watch our conservation work in two small village temples in remote Sum. You'll see where in the region we are going to soon also, to Sama village in Newbury, to create a preservation plan, to Racha Nunnery in Sum for conservation of historic tsatsa, and further up into the Himalayan regions, really far up, you'll see the map, to advise on paintings in two remote monasteries, really remote. You can then enjoy our project on Sumpa Cham. We're making a documentary about Cham dancing, Buddhist sacred dancing, from the community of Sum. I'm really grateful to my Buddhist teachers who continue to advise and guide this work since I began working in monasteries and communities in Nepal and India in 1970. That's 54 years ago. We are all grateful to our funders for these projects. The Firebird Foundation, continued support from the Pema Chodhan Foundation and Kensei Foundation. Treasure Caretaker Training, these are our TCT board members and advisors. TCT is dedicated to the preservation of sacred Buddhist treasures. We work directly with monastics and community members who are the daily caretakers of these treasures. We respectfully offer them low cost and practical tools that combine science with traditional methods and materials. We have a website. We developed it during COVID mostly. And it's called the Preservation of Buddhist Treasures Resource. It's free online with practical information for the preservation of texts, tanka, and other forms of Buddhist sacred art in daily use. It's written in direct response to questions asked by monastics and illustrated with images from their own monasteries. TCT works with all Buddhist lineages in many countries. Risk assessment. Preservation of historic treasures in monasteries and remote communities totally depends on the knowledge and disaster preparedness of the caretakers. Risk assessment and disaster planning are crucial. We share this practical approach in workshops and during on-site projects. And everywhere we're going, in Nepal on the Tibetan border, we'll be sharing risk assessment. This is a risk assessment workshop in Bhutan. Buddhist Store sponsored this video, which I'm not gonna show you now, but you can find on their website on protecting sacred art, risk assessment for monasteries and Dharma leaders. I hope you find it worthy to look at. Risk assessment is crucial for the prevention of damage which comes from fire, earthquake, water, the effects of temperature and relative humidity, pests, pollution, light, human choices, theft, and yes, pandemic. Also, when we're on site, we share 
very simple documentation methods using people's own smartphones, their own mobiles. This is an example of documentation by a monk of the last pieces of the wall paintings from the monastery shrine room, which had to be torn down after an earthquake. And this is what was left. And this is his documentation on his own smartphone. Now let's go on site. Rather than trek for five days, we helicopter in for 45 minutes. There are no roads. And supplies come on the helicopter or by human porter, pony, or yacht. Travel from village to village is on mountain paths. For example, this monastery is building an addition and the rebar had to come on the backs of the horses. Somebody in Canada donated a play structure for children and the helicopter could not carry it. So it was carried by human porter. You could see how heavy that is. That's a five day trek. Our helicopter landed at Sum Monastery. We're so grateful to Dungse Lama Pema and Lama Pasang for offering us a place to stay and for inviting us into the community to work on the village temples. Because I began documenting and working in remote areas in Nepal and Northern India 54 years ago, well, I know what to expect up there. But I must say that some team members found it really difficult and surprisingly cold and they were hungry and yeah, it's a very different life there. And at night, the wild foxes howl through the night. This is a traditional way of life where you eat what you farm and that's about it. The whole area is sacred and there's no killing. You can't kill any animals. So the diet has very little meat and very little dairy. There are notable number of abandoned structures due to earthquakes, but especially due to out migration of the younger generation. For example, this video shows her rediscovering her family home. She left when she was eight years old and hasn't been back until I now, until when I did this video of her rediscovering her family home, the monk she's with, he was her best friend and they played together when they were young. She now lives in Queens, New York and runs a restaurant and he teaches at Limbini Buddhist University and they're talking about their childhood. Her family owned up the mountain Condemned and abandoned structures are visible everywhere. They are profoundly beautiful in their own way. Fortunately though, the skill and materials of traditional building and rebuilding remain alive within the communities. Water has been pumped into this community of some fairly recently. Before that, the women had to go down a steep path to the river and carry the water back to their homes. This is for the whole village and everybody uses it. Traditional older homes show the way people have lived for centuries. Before she got her stove, there was an open wood fire and it has blackened the wood with soot and also people have a lot of lung problems from breathing it. It was used for cooking and for any warmth. The animals lived below and provided further warmth. I actually got along with everyone there really well. I had a wonderful time. The first small village temple that our TCT team worked in was called Lama Gaon, village temple. The current Lama, Lama Jamyang Dorje, 
was with us every single day, learning and helping. He is a product of 25 generations of married lamas that have lived in this region. Lama Gaon Temple had been somewhat rebuilt because the roof was leaking. So there was some government funding and a new roof was put on. These are the plans. However, in the design of putting the roof on, there was no longer any space left for the line of paintings, original paintings from at least four generations that had run up across the entire top of the temple near the ceiling. So they were put outside around the money wheel. They're really beautiful, but they are becoming damaged uh, with weather and with people touching them. This is a certain style of local painting. The original pillars and original woodwork above had so much beautiful traditional painting on them with raised detail. But with the new roof, again, the new woodwork did not allow for space for the beautiful paintings that ran around the top, but also the village wants to raise the funds to have the new woodwork repainted, to have it painted in the style of how it was originally. And there are people who can do that. The thing about the village temples we work in is that they're alive, they're alive and active. Something goes on in that temple every day. There's always prayers, recitations, uh, ceremonies for a birth, a death, for certain holidays of the lunar calendar. This is Lama Jamyan Dorje's father. And he made it clear that if we were to work on the statues and paintings on the shrine, that it would have to be deconsecrated. The deconsecration ceremony is not one that you often see. It's it's rare that you're allowed to see it. Here he's, I, I'm not going to play the recording for you, but here he is. He's doing the deconsecration ceremony so that the deity's presence will leave the statues and paintings while we work in them. And after it's all put back together after our work, there'll be another ceremony to invite them back in. Then community members came and took apart their shrine. Behind the statues on the shrine were the oldest paintings, generations old, and they have not been seen for, again, generations because they were behind everything else in the shrine. They're really beautiful and they had never been cleaned or restored or uh, consolidated anything. Uh, it was a really wonderful experience to be able to work with them. When on site for the last 20 years, I've made it a practice to bring little data loggers so that I'm informed and I can share with the community the temperature, relative humidity, and light levels within a temple or wherever we're working. I use these in museums too. The arrows pointing to one on the bookshelf. And it was approximately seven degrees C, which is like 40 degrees Fahrenheit when we were working. We were seen to work in <laughs> full gear with coats and hats and sometimes even gloves. It was a little warmer to work on the front steps of the temple when the sun was out and it wasn't raining. 
And here is one of our TCT members, Aishwarya, sharing her work with some uh, community women who came to see how she was doing it. And they're also having a nice chat about things. Very wonderful. The community was very much with us on this project. Something interesting in the old window wells or certain paintings that were tied up there and they had been there for a very long time. They were covered with cobwebs and dust. The lamas translated them and told us that they were placed there by family members of past generations. If someone died, they would have this special panel painting made for them with all the information written on the back, their name, etc. And then, they, then they'd hang it in this special place in the temple by the window. We were allowed to take them down and to work on them as conservators. And then they went back up next to the windows on the stone. Again, the community participation was really inspiring. And we had community members wanting to try uh, their hand brushing and see what we were doing. There are lots of questions. And really made you feel that you were invited in. At the same time, you know that you're a guest in the community and you're there to serve them. This is one of our TCT members, Corinne Long. She's a really talented painting conservator and she's sharing her skills working on the back halo of a statue. She's consolidating the paint that had been powdering off. These had never been repainted. She's really good. And also working with her, I don't have a picture here, is Patricia Smithin, who is the head of conservation training at Queen's University in Canada. This is Craig Deller, our amazing objects conservator. And he's working with Lama Jamyan Dorje, teaching him some cleaning techniques. Craig just loves to work with people. He's uh, really patient and knows a lot. Lama Jamyang Dorje was entranced with cleaning this Padmasambhava statue, which is really powerful for his village. It was just a beautiful moment, I think, that this photo shows. He's treating it with such respect. His father was greatly concerned about the condition of his, the original texts. His father asked us to please raise the funds to come back and complete with paper conservation, the, the uh, structure of the, of the paper uh, pages, and then he would write in to continue the text that was lost. He asked us to please return. In the end, after the community put everything back together, and you can hardly see those beautiful paintings behind, they were really, really happy with it. And therefore we were happy. It was a, a, just an amazing experience, the whole thing. When we were there, Craig Lewis, who's a journalist with Buddhist Dora, he interviewed Lama Jamyan Dorje and he, he watched us work. And he wrote an article about a, our work that's published on Buddhist Door Net. There's a series of two. And I hope that you have a chance to access it and read it. He has really good insights into the community, the traditional community, and how we work with traditional communities. Our next village temple was Leru Village Temple. We walked through the fields for about 40 minutes every day and then walked back. It was quite lovely. There are many abandoned buildings in that area, in Leru Village. The village is really beautiful, but quite a number of houses were condemned after the earthquake. And the previous temple also had to be torn down. It's astoundingly beautiful there. Two years ago, when I was there by myself, I was invited to a shed near Leiru Temple. I was shown these wall paintings. These were taken out of the original temple before it was taken down because it was condemned after the earthquake. And the lamas, this is Lama Pasang, and the, the village leader asked me if our conservators could work on them so they could be 
installed in the new layer temple, or should they just have new ones painted? And I said, certainly, we'd love to work on them. Please do reinstall them in the, in the new temple, and then our team will come and help you with them. They were stacked against each other in this unheated shed, but even then I could see how beautiful they were. The temple was built around an existing money wheel. This is the money wheel on your left, and it was covered with quite beautiful hand painting on cloth, really elegant painting. However, the community decided to cover the painting with these copper sheets, which were uh, created in Kathmandu and brought up uh, by Pony. See how beautifully and traditionally the new temple was made. All of the woodwork will be painted. So these are the paintings after they're reinstalled. They were in very conditions. The iconography was very important to the region. Every detail was really inspiring. Here's one on the left that we brought it. Um, in, we're in process of working on it. And the right, we're still working on it. Avalokiteshvara and Padmasambhava. And of course, again, Layer of Village came to visit us as well, which is so inspiring. And they wanted to try, and we let them try. That was the whole point. We're called Treasure Caretaker Training, TCT, because we love to share all of our knowledge and information with people where we go, where we're invited in. She actually was quite talented as an in painter quite talented. So we did do extensive consolidation, cleaning and consolidation on these paintings and just some in painting. The community loved to come and visit and bring their children and ask about what we were doing. These nuns are from Racha Nunnery. And you'll hear about Racha Nunnery soon because that's one of the places we're going in May. The nuns are holding little patches, treasure caretaker training, little patches that Craig Deller, our conservator, had made up. They were very popular. Again, wherever I go, I bring along data logging equipment. This is really important. And the company Conserve has generously donated enough of them so that wherever we go in the future, we can leave one with the community teach them how to use it, and they can easily see the condition in their temples at night, in the winter, in the summer. It's such important information, and we're happy to share these data loggers with them. Here it is. It was 8 degrees C when we were working, sometimes 7 degrees C, and even 6, and that means it was really cold. For you, that is mostly, let's say, 45 degrees Fahrenheit. When our team finished our work on the paintings, there was a lovely ceremony. We had lunch together and we were presented with scarves. Everyone was really happy. I think what was so wonderful about these two projects is that we were invited in by the community. The community was there almost all the time and everyone was happy with our work. And it's very beautiful up there in the mountains. Let's talk about our current on-site preservation projects for this year. First place we're going in May is the town of Sama, Sama village in Newbury. I'm going there for preservation planning for the next few years. Just as work in the two village temples in Sum had been planned, I had gone and written reports and planned it. The same for Sama in Newbury, we're going there by helicopter. Usually these projects begin with an official letter and a map. We need an official letter for our funders and then the map gives us an idea of the area we'll be working in. Sama village in Newbury is the home village of two very respected lamas worldwide. That is Minji Rinpoche and his brother Sony Rinpoche. Here's Sonny Rinpoche visiting his hometown. 
and blessing people. And on the top is the nunnery. For those interested in texts, you'll see that these texts are all handwritten. They're not block printed. And this is very rare. And they are requesting up-to-date scanning of these texts and also conservation treatment for the originals. In so many locations, funds come in to scan everything, scan, 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 like a machine, scan, scan, scan. And the original blessed sacred texts are not cared for. There's no funding left for conservation of them. And as conservators, we feel it's so important uh, to conserve the originals and people in the villages, the scholars and the lamas, everybody agrees with us about that. There are wall paintings in Sama village that also need our help. Again, we're being invited in by the community. After Sama village in May, we have a project in Rachin nunnery in Sum. You saw the nuns holding the TCT patches. And Rachin nunnery was one of the most beloved places from Lama Zopa, who just who died last year. Lama Zopa was a Lama who's beloved and known all over the world. And Rachin nunnery was one of his favorite places in the whole world. In fact, he actually died there. I received blessings from him the night before he died. Inside, nothing has been changed. Very little has been changed. And it has, uh, it has artifacts of several lineages, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Our project there is to preserve the many, many hundreds of tzatza or clay tablets with images of deities on them that lines the walls of the original nunnery meditation hall. Our TCT team of five with conservator Craig Deller as technical lead will be there soon and we're all looking forward to it. We'll be living at the nunnery. To get to the nunnery from Tsum, you have to cross this bridge over the raging river and hopefully you cross it when there isn't a herd of cattle or ponies coming the other direction because it really sways. Another of our TCT team members, Karma Decky, is an amazingly talented filmmaker. And she's helping us by making videos for us from the footage that we collect in places. This video introduces conservation of tzatza. No removing paint. No, never. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's a very good, good approach. Yeah. A really good approach. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When is the last time these were painted? This yes, yes. Uh, there was about this ceremony. Uh, that is it. Uh, he's only to fix that, not cleaning anything, any times. Okay. Not mm. bending. Excellent. Yeah. All right. We'll be working with the nuns on this project inside. After we finish working on the tzatza, we're going on an amazing adventure, which is not for the faint of heart. Our team has been invited to a further location further into the mountains at a much higher altitude to advise on conservation of historic and iconographically significant wall paintings. We'll be traveling on horseback over the mountain ridges to Dedra Nunnery and Rigang Monastery. There's the Racha Nunnery on your left and that's the path we'll be taking on the ponies. Sometimes the ponies aren't in very good moods. <laughs> And the saddles, well, they're not all that comfortable. I remember once I took a pony ride for work 
And at the end, I got off and um, I let my the the monk ride on the pony, and I was happy to walk, <laughs> even on the mountain range. <laughs> this is the nunnery we'll be visiting. It's very, very high up for altitude. And here are some of the paintings, the wall paintings. They'd like us to assess for further conservation treatment. And you could see that they're quite elegant and beautifully painted. The final project I want to share with you today is our Cham video, Tsumpa Cham. Tsumpa means it's from Tsum. Cham is Buddhist sacred dance. And we have a video we've made up with Karma Deki, our very talented filmmaker and video editor, about the preservation of robes, masks, and boots. The interesting part about this video, it's not just about the dance. A lot of people show how beautiful the dance is and how interesting and colorful. It's about the preparation for it, preparing the costumes, trying on, and especially the rehearsals. Here, the dance master from Benton Monastery in, in Kathmandu, he's a dance master. He is teaching the nuns how to do this specific dance. That's a very important part of the Sumpacham. <laughs> At night, the men were practicing in the cold night. It was really beautiful. Here's an image from the dance with all the costumes. This is very interesting. It's rare that you see the cycle of Milarepa's life ever performed. This is done by a professional theater troupe from Kathmandu. <laughs> It ended with the village women dancing. And then, since it was raining through a lot of the, of the dances, everything was dried in the courtyard. As conservators, we care about these costumes lasting into future generations. And so we were asked to advise on how they could be more safely stored. Not in an untraditional way, just some hints about how. And so at the end of our longer Tsupacham video, our filmmaker put together a little video on the care of robes and boots and masks and a very simple way to wrap them so that they last longer. We'd like to show you this. This short video, which is just part of our larger one sponsored by the Kensei Foundation, this short video actually is getting a lot of play in monasteries and amongst conservators.
People ask, where can they get stuffing like that up in the mountains? And we just purchased some inexpensive pillows in Kathmandu and had, and had them brought up on the helicopter. They're not heavy and by porters. And that's what we use. The cotton is from the pillow, cover of the pillow, and the stuffing is from the pillows. We're almost at the end. I wanted to say that I get asked this, these questions. You seem to be working all the time when you're there. Do you ever have a day off? And if you had a day off, what would you do with that day off? Because some once I was in Bhutan for four and a half months without a day off. But if I had a day off, I'll share with you what I would do. Number one is that I would visit a respected teacher who really cared about preservation and having sacred objects last and for future generations. And when I'm there, I'm there to work so I can't attend lengthy abhishegas and blessings. But some time with a respected teacher is so amazing. For example, this is the Venerable Tranga Rinpoche. He uh, died last year and since the early 1980s, he was one of my major sources of information. Before the younger generation of teachers began to talk about preservation, to advise me on approach so that I would have the correct approach as a Buddhist, a respectful approach, and also how to work within the monastic structure. And all sorts of um, questions I had from him about how conservation science related to the sacred of Buddhist teachings. And Tranga Rinpoche was the most patient. For years, he would answer my questions. He would come to my house where I live and work in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and he would look at what tankas I had in to work on as a conservator. So it meant so much to see him before he, right before he became ill and died. And the folder in front of him shows our work and he was asking through a translator so many questions about the work we were doing because he had been following it. And um, it was so inspiring. The next thing I do when I'm away in com communities is play with children. Here, I'm offering rubber duckies, which I brought from Halifax to all of the little preschool children in the Compassion Project Preschool at Sum Monastery. And then we ran around the monastery courtyard with our rubber duckies, and I read them a story, a good time was had by all. So always play with children. The next is meet with your fellow travelers. Meet with your friends and colleagues. When you're on the road in remote areas, take the time, treasure the time to have a meal together hang out and support each other in so many ways. We're almost at the end of our time together and I'm curious about your questions very much. But I want to say there's one question that often comes up from Dharma people. And that is, why do you want to make things last forever when there's impermanence? <laughs> and my answer is always, for the sake of people coming in the future generations, so they can receive the blessings and be inspired. The Buddhist thought about impermanence is profoundly relevant, as a matter of fact, in our discussion of conservation as a profession, because we endeavor to preserve both tangible and intangible sacred art forms 
that are fundamentally fragile. When we're invited into a community, we are honored guests and we are the guests. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to your questions. Uh, Professor Anne, thank you for the outstanding lecture and for generously sharing your beautiful work. Your lifelong commitment to conservation is genuinely commendable and your effort has inspired countless individuals, including me, and we sincerely appreciate you. And in the future, I would like to invite you to give a treasure uh, caretaking training event for our students uh, who can learn to do the restoration work at our school. And now we begin our questions and session. Uh, kindly submit your questions in the chat box. And uh, before we see any other question, I will put forward, I have some question. <laughs> uh, who and what uh, inspire you to do such outstanding work? <laughs> okay, well, I grew up in New York City. And on the weekends, I would go to museums. And when I was in second grade, I saw Tonkas in the American Museum of Natural History, which later became one of my clients for Tonka conservation. And as a young child, I was fascinated with Tonkas and I went to libraries and read whatever was available. So that was at a very young age. And I also started to meditate really young. Uh, in 1970, I was fortunate, that's 54 years ago, I went to India and Nepal, and I was fortunate to meet the previous Karmapa, the 16th Karmapa, who said shortly after that he felt that my Dharma work for this lifetime was the preservation of Buddhist tankas and other art forms, but not to do it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I also uh, met other very inspiring teachers in 1970, like the eighth Kamchul Rinpoche, who was a master painter, and also spoke to me at length about uh, the meaning of sacred art. And also I met Gelek Rinpoche, who was the scholar at Tibet House in Delhi, who spent hours and hours talking with me about how I could spot fakes that were just then, even in 1970, coming onto the tourist art market. So then I went and actually learned how to do the work well by going to graduate school for many years. Through all of it, I have always checked in with learned and respected teachers because I feel that it's important to have the, the right attitude, the right motivation, and um, always to ask questions. I'm so grateful to them and grateful to our funders, of course. And there's one question regarding the funding here. Where and how could we make donations to support these projects? Thank you so much. Uh, if you go to our website, treasurecaretaker.com, you'll see the treasures resources, all the risk assessment in several languages, but also there's a donate button. We would be so grateful for this. Thank you, really appreciate it. The local communities are very excited about this kind of conservation work. Uh, the question is, how are local communities actively engaged in conservation effort to protect the Buddhist treasure and relic in Sum Valley? I'd like to preface my, my answer with, um, there's there's two main points on this. One is the rapidity of social change with uh, younger generations leaving and the road coming eventually through to China, perhaps. And the elders really want to document the, the traditional way of life. And that involves a lot of preservation. That's number one. And that's a reason I'm being invited to Sama village also in Newbury. And the second answer to this is something I'd like you to be aware of in that just because a conservator or someone that calls himself a restorer comes to your community, doesn't mean that they have um, a motivation um, that would actually respect the sacred art object. For example, there have been really bad examples of restorers going to a remote community and over cleaning tankas, like scrubbing them and then repainting them. 
And they say, well, that's the way we do it in museums. And in actual fact, um, that's far beyond what's done in museums. And there's another way to go about it. If the community would like to see how a darkened painting or statue originally looked, a true conservator could do consolidation to keep it from falling apart and then do digital restoration. Take a lot of photos and you can bring it back to probably the way it looked when it was originally made in a purely virtual world. In other words, you can have, uh, you can show uh, some of the darkness taken away, some of the cracks taken away, and then uh, you can show what it probably looked like just when it was finished and blessed. To do this, the person doing it has to have good photos to work with, high res, but also be very, very familiar with the iconography and also be a whiz on the computer. So there are people that are doing this. And if any of you would like to have that done, I have someone to suggest who lives in Sweden. Yeah, uh, that's the way I would suggest uh, not overcleaning and not no, no overpainting in any way. And I think more communities are understanding that for sure, that they have to protect their own heritage. They're the guardians of it for future generations. Thank you. And I'm training to be a preventive conservator and was curious how you are using the data from your logger. Is the goal to educate on environmental impact and potential management recommendation? And what are some practical approaches in these remote places? Yeah, I'm so thrilled to hear from someone who's working in preventive conservation. That is uh, one of the most uh, recent fields that a conservator can go into. And it's so important. Gone are the days where a conservator would be paid for an entire year to work on one tiny painting or statue. Here we are in the communities working where it really matters. And we wanna be able to help them prevent damage for the future using risk assessment and other scientific uh, approaches to that. So preventive conservation is absolutely 100% important. And uh, the way, and so thank you so much for asking that question, really. I'm, I'm so happy that you did. Uh, in terms of the data, uh, this may surprise you, but I believe in client confidentiality. And in a community or a monastery, what I learn or see there stays there, unless we have express permission. So any of the images you see from a monastery or, or town, village, community, we have their permission to share. So there's no overall answer about the data. I think it's more for their information and certainly for our information when we're working, when we find that some of our chemicals or consolidants are not working well, because it's really cold. Again, another question. Are you working with BDRC on the text preservation? Text preservation, unfortunately, mostly means scanning. So you're taking the information and the teachings, but not preserving the original. And as a conservator, I care about preserving the original blessed sacred text. We are going to end here. Once again, heartfelt gratitude to Professor Anne Safto for delivering an outstanding presentation. And thank you all attendees and may you have a delightful evening. Thank you. Thank you.